Video 6 Teachings of Father Joe Cain Title Jesus a Substitute Victim and Deliver Us from Evil for Holy Week Part 2 I had a friend of mine, Matt Menger, who worked in North Vietnam and South Vietnam, and he saw people die because of their faith. He saw children with boys with uh, drums, or rather bamboo slivers driven into their ears for listening to the word of God, and a priest with his tongue cut out for preaching the word of God. And so really the great struggle between North Vietnam and South Vietnam was the struggle between those who do not believe in God and those who believe in God. But all this didn't come out in the international news. So when the presence, the, the presence that was containing this was withdrawn, Vietnam fell and Cambodia fell. And uh, there was a person that came into Cambodia in charge in the name of pure Marxist experimentation. Uh, I think the name was Phil Pot, if I remember correctly. And under him, five million people of Cambodia perished. They said it was the greatest genocide since the time that the Jews were exterminated under Hitler. That was another example of put to the test because of a man who didn't know anything about God. And uh, the ones who came out of there and told the story, it was a nightmare. They tried to do away with all religion. And once religion was done away with and the protection of the Lord, then people were the victims of ideology and victims of the power struggle. And so all those classes that thought were thought to be dangerous, professors, leaders of the people, uh, teachers and priests were done away with. And when the bloodbath was finished over a period of years, five million people, almost half the population of Cambodia, had perished. And it reminds us of the word of the Lord in Isaiah. The just men perish, and no one takes it to heart. But Jesus took it to heart. And so as we see this setting, both of today and of the past, we can understand then the sentiments of the heart of Jesus when he sat down at the table at supper and said to his disciples, with great desire I have desired to eat this Pasch with you, which means this Passover. And then he went through the rite of the Eucharist. This is my body. This is my blood. The blood of the new and everlasting covenant, it will be shed for you and for all, so that sins may be forgiven. Shed for you and all, so that men will not be victims of one another. Shed for you and all, because I am going to be put to the test. I am going to be the one who comes head on, in a head-on collision with evil and conquering evil, so that you will not collide with evil. I am the one who is going to be lifted up above the earth so that the human race will not have to pass through the test. And so happy are all those who accept the word of God and happy are those who believe because they will pass from life, pardon me, from death to life or from life to life without having passed to pass through the judgment and the judgment is the test. And the judgment is that clash with evil. And the judgment is that power that the enemy has in the world, had in the world in the time of Christ, had in the time of Hosea, and has in our times. And so today, during this Holy Week, if we are ones that are going to stand with Jesus in his test, we are ones that are going to know what is the goal of the kingdom and how do we avoid being put to the test. I'd like to share another little example. And it's the story of the Canadian who saved Ceylon. Story from Reader's Digest, February 83, page 90. And I quote, World War II had just ended. 
At a diplomatic dinner in Washington, Churchill was asked what its most dangerous and distressing moment had been. His moment of greatest alarm came in April 1942 with word that a Japanese fleet was steaming for Ceylon. The capture of Ceylon, which is Sri Lanka now, the consequent control of the Indian Ocean, and the possibility of a German conquest of Egypt would have closed the ring and the failure would have been black, or the future would have been black. But the courage of an unknown airman, whose bones now whiten the ocean floor, as Churchill put it, with some emotion, saved the Allies from disaster. Patrolling the Indian Ocean, the pilot and crew had spotted the fleet and continued radoing, radoing the alarm until the Japanese fighters drove their plane into the sea. The airman, called Pierce Birchall, as was revealed by Pearson at that particular meeting, was an RCAF officer, Len Birchall. He survived. That's the human dimension of uh, what happened in Ceylon. Now, what is the faith dimension? Several months prior to that, one of our oblate bishops, it's rather interesting that one of the texts in Numbers speaks of oblates, which means offering to God. And that's what our name oblate means, an offering to the Lord, turned over, dedicated to the Lord. Realized that Ceylon was going to be the next attack of the Japanese. So he went to a shrine of Our Lady and on his knees offered to consecrate Ceylon to the Lord through the intercession of Mary and asking that Ceylon be protected from the war and from invasion. And then he went back and although only 10% of Ceylon was Christian, he announced confidently and publicly that Ceylon would not be invaded. And it was not. So there we see the beautiful uh, collaboration between the divine and the human. On one side, there are persons capable of entering into the human situation without judgment, but simply giving their lives or risking their lives in order to save a situation. And then the power of the Lord coming in through a dedication and a consecration in order to protect. We have to be careful about judging any situation, especially a situation of war, whether it's in in the Pacific or in Europe, in Canada or in the States or wherever. Because there are such deep-rooted dimensions in all histories of wars that we would have to be pulling the spaghetti out of the pot until we hit the bottom of the pot, which would be maybe 3,000 years ago. So the only possibility in which we can address a situation of violence, whether in the past or present, is simply to look at it without judgment, without anger, and to intercede. And that is why our Lord, uh, our Lord said through St. Paul, I would have men and women in all places lift hands in prayer without judgment, without anger. So these were the sentiments of our Lord when he sat down at table with the twelve. And uh, at that time, I guess it was the eleven, as we see in John chapter 17, verses 15 to 20. We use that text quite a lot, but it's always powerful and always up to date. And very apropos for Holy Week. In background, we realize that our Lord had offered not to put, uh, had offered them the Holy Spirit, and now He says, "I have watched over them so that not one of them is lost, except the one who chose to be lost." And this was to fulfill the Scriptures. But now I am coming to you, and while still in the world, I say these things to share my joy with them to the full. I passed your word on to them, and the world hated them because they did not belong to the world any more than I belong to the world. I am not asking you to remove them from the world, but to protect them from the evil one. 
Consecrate them in truth. Your word is truth. I'm skipping a few words to bring out the dimension. The world, the evil one, consecration, truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world, and for their sake I consecrate myself, so that they too may be consecrated in truth. And so the first great protection against the evil one, against being put to the test, is being consecrated to Jesus Christ in truth, when we turn ourselves completely over to him. We'll have a time for some work in the groups, and we'll take some more tests that are texts that bring out some of the dimensions of what we do to avoid being put to the test.